I'm your host, Marsha Florence for Just Ask. Today's show, ladies and gentlemen, is Detroit Recovery Project Incorporated. Hurry back and join us. I'm your host, Marsha Florence from Just Ask. Today's show, ladies and gentlemen, is Detroit Recovery Project Incorporated. And we have the president and CEO himself, a returning wonderful guest, Andre Johnson. Good morning, Andre. Good morning, Marcia. How are you? I'm fine, fine. Glad to have you back. It's an honor to be back on the Just Ask talk show. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> well, Andre, I had to have you come back and join us because we have a lot of things going on and one of them in particular has something to do with uh, your organization itself. But let's go over a recap. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what's going on with Detroit Recovery Project. Sure. Well, uh, Detroit Recovery Project is a recovery community organization in the city of Detroit. And what that means is we're an organization that focuses on helping people who have substance use disorder challenges and helping people to find recovery and sustain long-term recovery from drug and alcohol uses. Uh, me, myself, I am a person in long-term recovery, and what that means, Marcia, is I have not used any drugs or alcohol in over 29 and a half years. And if it had not Great. been for long-term recovery, I certainly wouldn't probably be a guest <laughs> here today. Well, now. Okay. Um, but um, this is an organization that um, I'm humble to say that um, I helped to, I founded the organization. Mm -hmm. We've been around a little over 15 years. Uh, we have a team of about 50 employees that work hard every day to help people change the trajectory of their lives. Uh, oftentimes, people uh, who have substance use disorder challenges um, <coughs> struggle to find recovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we have a location on the east side of Detroit, the west side of, west side of Detroit. Uh, and we service about four, four to 500 people per month. Wow, wow. that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, so you know the program itself firsthand. Uh, yes, I do. Okay, okay. So nobody can get past you with this. You know, yeah. well, I'm coming today, but I might show up tomorrow. And you know, by you being familiar with the situation, you can tell when a person is, you know, you know ready to go into recovery, more or less. Yeah, I can kind of detect where they are. Okay. Uh, a lot of times, people um, seek treatment or services because of employment because of legal situations, uh, because of spouses, children, whatever the case may be. Um, but I can just about tell where a person's motivation is at. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have a lot of ambivalence, uh, meaning that they feel like they, they might want to get it, n not today, but maybe next week. No. <laughs> and, okay. and sometimes those, um, those dilemmas can either allow a person to access recovery or in some cases the situation can progress and get worse okay. and mm -hmm. when we're talking about addiction it's important to always understand that addiction is a disease mm -hmm. and um, if the disease is not treated it progresses and gets worse right. um, and it's also important to understand that some people do relapse and relapse does not mean failure uh, but it is an opportunity to to get back on the path of recovery. So, you know, and, and with that being said, Andre, you, you're giving a person at home who's watching the show today what I would say hope. So some people, like you say, they relapse and they say, I will never get right. I don't have to, you know, this is just how I am. And that's not true. You do have opportunities to be in an agency such as yours and get some help. So tell us a little bit about, I know you got what they call the training coaches. Got training coaches? Yeah, yeah, so we have a team of certified uh, state of Michigan recovery coaches. Uh, these coaches have received, um, on an average, about 100 training hours, mm -hmm. along with internship uh, um, opportunities. And these individuals are trained to help 
people sustain long-term recovery. In the city of Detroit, we average about 15,000 people a year going through treatment. And what we found that out of those 15,000 people, over half of them were relapsing within that first 30 days upon wow. exiting treatment. And so that's kind of how the Detroit Recovery Project um, came to fruition, was to be the safety net in the community. And so when people complete 30 days mm -hmm. or two weeks of treatment or a detox, then they come to our agency. And our agency is to help meet people exactly where they are, help people sustain recovery right inside their communities and help them achieve whatever personal goals that they may desire. Some people come to us saying, hey, um, I need help uh, going to college, I need help uh, going to uh, training school or okay. employment. And so part of what our coaches do is help people with that process. Okay. Uh, parenting, uh, financial, uh, people need help with their finance, just how to budget, how to finance. Right. They need help on how to prepare meals. So we try to do a little bit of, of, of everything. Now, do the coaches that you train, I mean, how long is the training process? So the training, the initial training is a five-day training uh, okay. from 9 to 5, 40 hours a week, um, very intense. And then there's another 80 hours of, of training that occurs on the computer, mm -hmm. uh, of online training. Right. Okay, yeah. all right. So that prepares them for the clients that they're going to see. Yeah, and so okay. the, 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 I'm sorry, the, the coaches are people who are in long-term recovery themselves. Oh, wow, so, okay. So um, we have what we, what we call a peer-led, peer-ran, peer-driven program. That means our coaches have, they know what it's like to be on the dark side, for lack of better words. Okay. And okay. so sometimes people in recovery are the, the shining light for other people mm -hmm. who are seeking recovery. Because sometimes people in recovery want to talk to somebody that they can relate right, to, right. talk to somebody right. that they can identify mm -hmm. with. And that's what makes the beauty of the Detroit Recovery Project is that 90% of our employees have a colorful background. That's great. I mean, you know, and, and you hit it on the head, the nail on the head, because if you've been through something that I'm going through, and I tell you, you don't know, you don't have an idea, you don't have a clue, stop right there. Sure. I already know where you are. And then sometimes if a person is having a relapse moment, a person who's a coach can catch that person because they can see the signs. Is that possible that they can see the signs of a person almost relapsing, or if they are relapsing, you know, mm -hmm. let me let me stop you before it gets too far. Right, right. Okay. Marcia, I think that's an excellent point. Um, so before people relapse, their behavior mm -hmm. tends to before they get to the point of picking the drugs up, they're usually acting out right. in some kind of form or fashion. Um, temperature, I'm uh, not temperature, but um, um, tend not to be patient, mm -hmm. um, tend to be a little overzealous. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, their, t their temperament changes and it's, it's obvious something's uh, going on like, On the know. edge, right. ang angry, upset. Mm -hmm. Those are what we call red light indicators. Okay. That, oh, yeah. um, you know, if I see you, okay, for the last two months you've been even keel and then over the last week you've been cussing, you've mm -hmm. been a little intolerant, you haven't really been patient and and usually, and, you, and if you don't check that, then they're headed for self-destruction. Right, right. And they're going to use it as their outlet because if you don't recognize it, well, I can just walk out the door now because you're no help to me and this doesn't and, make sense. And we usually say relapse starts before the person picks up. It starts mentally. Some people have those reservations. And part of those reservations sometimes can be not being able to let go of certain people in your life. In other right. words, some people can be what they call triggers. And there's uh, all types of triggers. It's sometimes true. it's the environment, mm -hmm. sometimes it's people, sometimes it's a pay it's a paycheck. It's money. I hope it's not money, Andre, but it, it probably <laughs> is. But I tell you what, we're gonna take a break and ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna come back with some more very good information on Detroit Recovery Project Incorporated. We'll be right back. 
Together, we can change the conversation and focus on preventing substance use disorders and connecting people who are suffering with the treatment, services, and recovery support they need. We will not hide from this issue because it's hard to talk about. Prevention works. Treatment is effective. Recovery is possible for everyone. For the first time, the United States Surgeon General has prepared a report on alcohol, drugs, and health. Our goal, to provide real hope for the millions of people and their families suffering from addiction. Together, we can prevent alcohol and drug-related addiction. And with treatment, we can give those suffering a new outlook on life. Facing Addiction in America, the Surgeon General's Report on Alcohol, Drugs, and Health. To read the report, please visit addiction.surgeongeneral.gov. And welcome back to the show. Now, those of you who are just not joining us, we have the President and CEO himself, Andre Johnson of Detroit Recovery Project Incorporated. And Andre was touching on the basis about coaching. So we're going to go back to the questions because some of you may be interested in taking the class so that you can be prepared to help your loved ones or someone in the neighborhood or just be involved, period, as a person who's interested in supporting an organization such as Detroit Recovery Project. So, Andre, I wanted to ask you about the uh, training uh, part itself. Now, is there any funding or anything? How do you guys, you know, get into this training? Sure. G great question, Marcia. We uh, got funded a federal grant last year from uh, Health Resource Service Administration, and we created a new entity called Recovery Training Institute. Uh, I thought it would really, really be important to have a training institute in the city of Detroit um, and train folks so that they can prepare to be a certified recovery coach. And once you become a certified recovery coach, you can take that credential and work anywhere in the state of Michigan wow. in state-funded substance abuse programs. Recovery coaching is is a fair it's a a new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It's a new paradigm shift, meaning that instead of having a whole lot of therapists and social workers to treat and help people who need who suffer from substance use disorders. Now the approach has shifted where you hire recovery coaches okay. and the recovery coaches help people. Uh, this past year, I'm really proud to say we've, um, we've trained 160 people. Uh, the federal government just refunded us for the next five years to train another 160 people per year. That's great. And so imagine, you train 160 people, mm -hmm. those 160 people now have a skill and they can take that skill and go work Mm -hmm. somewhere else and so it's helping the economy it's helping uh, people employability skills um, however there are some challenges and what I mean by that is um, certain um, people most people have had a criminal record mm -hmm. okay. and, and sometimes and right now our state is revamping okay. the, the system where I forget the name. Well, some things are expungible and some things aren't. Okay. Well, the way the expungement program mm -hmm. works is you can only have one, one offense, right. um, and it has to be so many years before that can be mm -hmm. expunged. So what makes our program unique is, and our we have really strong relationships in our community. Our, our city government, our county government has really embraced our organization. And I would think that, you know, with, with what you're just saying that uh, – persons who are being trained as coaches have had some previous knowledge or experience themselves where they're not going to be excluded if they had, you know, the run-ins with the law or anything. So some of that should be wavered probably according to what it is, you know, or better yet, in terms of your funding and program and everything, it's got to have some consideration for things that people have done in their life. And a lot of things that people have done in their life, and I've known this from my own experience in, in working uh, with, as an advocate for persons with disabilities, uh, returning citizens and things like that, is that most of the incidents that occurred, occurred when they were teenagers. And so, that's the really sad right, part. Right, so that's at 18 or 14, you know, this, this caper you pull follows you through life and it never goes away, okay? Or you can keep doing the same thing and, you know, well, maybe I didn't get in trouble when I was 18, I got in trouble when I was 25. But whenever you got in trouble, depending on what it was, it stuck. It stuck with you the rest of your life. So if you robbed a liquor store and you never had a, a felony before, now you got one. 
So now you can't go work for the post office, nor can you work for the gaming commission. Or, so or, or just being with the wrong company. Just being in you the know, wrong I've, company. I've seen guys um, go to college, Michigan State, um, or any college for that matter. Morehouse, perhaps. And, well, <laughs> we didn't do <laughs> but Morehouse men don't do that. Okay. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but just sometimes being in the wrong company at the wrong time. Correct. Can cause can cause you to get a criminal record mm -hmm. at 17, 18, 19 years old, and 20, 25 years later, you still paying the consequences for that crime, That's right. even though the time has been served, the probation has been served, mm -hmm. the parole has been served. But people want to disqualify you from having a fair mm -hmm. opportunity and doing something you want to do. I mean, we live in America. And this is supposed to be the land, the free. This is the land of opportunity. Right. And when people pay their dues, I think people deserve an opportunity. And, and you do, but you know what? You also got to look at it like this. We're, we're in a, uh, a culture right now where a lot of things are, I'm going to ask you this because it's going to fit the, the, the conversation, like medical marijuana. So with the open door policy now coming into effect that you can have your um, you know, dispensaries or you can have a person that's your caregiver, it's a lot of things going on with that. So what is your take on the medical marijuana test? So because I, it, it's going it's to tie in with just like what you're saying about so I think coaches and everything. I think the medical marijuana term is a little misleading. I'm, I'm okay with it in terms of people who may suffer from uh, Parkinson oh, chronic uh, diseases. or any mm -hmm. chronic disease mm -hmm. that may need it for medicinal purposes but my concern related to m medical quote-unquote marijuana is the proliferation the access um, more the more accessible the more people are going to use it mm -hmm. um, I've already heard stories about young kids um, taking um, edibles to school oh and they eating their chocolate chip Marijuana cookies. Oh, no. And all the kids running around the school with red eyes. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> no, not, not, <laughs> the, not the chocolate chip. <laughs> I mean, you know, but, but look at it like this, okay, because this, that's a double-edged sword, okay? So there's a person who has a chronic condition that needs some type of therapeutic method, and medical marijuana is on the table, and then there's the opioid crisis. Oh. Now, I mean, um, we haven't even touched on that. Well, and, and, the, and the opioid, that's the Trojan horse in itself. Okay, so, you know, two and one, you can't, you, well, I shouldn't say you can't, but if you look at the picture, one uh, is even more severe in its methods than the other. I mean, the opioid crisis is really on the table now. It's on the front table. They pushed the miracle marijuana issue to the back burner because, like, oh, we're going to come back to that. Right now, we need to do something with the opioid crisis. Well, and to talk, me, they're you, both you, hand and, in and hand. And you're talking about two billion, multi-billion dollar right, industries. Right, right. The medical, the marijuana is it's about profit. I mean, the, you know, states are looking at other states that are profiting, like Denver, Colorado. It's more about mm -hmm. the money versus the actual treatment. But Just like opioid. Opioid okay. was, quote, unquote, um, in our state alone, there were over 11 million prescriptions written in the state of Michigan in 2015, 2016. More prescriptions have been written in our state than the number of individuals that live in our state. We've had That's more bad. people die of opioid overdose mm -hmm. than any other death. That's traffic fatalities, that's gun violence. People are overdosing. Mm -hmm. And again, this opioid was brought here to what? Treat a chronic disorder, to treat some type of pain, to treat some type of health condition, and now it's totally out of control. Right, it, it really is. And, and, and what I'm saying to that is that, you know, at that point when you get the opioid addiction and then somebody says, well, I'm gonna stop taking these meds, but I'm gonna use medical marijuana because, you know, when I have a panic attack, anxiety, or whatever, this soothes me. You know, I can eat the gummy bears and I can be calm. I don't have to smoke it, but I can eat the gummy bear. Mm -hmm. I can eat the cookie. Well, on the opioid addiction, I got to take a pill. I don't want to take a pill anymore. So, you know. So one of the things about opioids that most people don't know is when you take those pills for um, a day on a daily basis mm -hmm. over about two, they say to estimate it takes about two weeks to become addicted. Two weeks. And I was going to say two years. So no, I tell you what, two weeks. you got to hold that. We'll be right back. I'm home. Over a million Americans at risk of foreclosure have been helped by making home affordable. Find out now what your options I'm are. I'm home where I belong.
And welcome back to the last half of the show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Andre Johnson and I have a very intense conversation here about substance abuse, opioids, and training programs. Now, he left off with a question or answer so much about two weeks into a hospitalization that a person may be addicted to opioids. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and so what I was saying is typically it takes about two weeks before people can be find themselves addicted to opioids. Um, and what happens is the addiction can, uh, can I don't want to say start, but as little as two weeks, you, your body can become dependent on opioids. And so imagine you now have this addiction. You do not understand you have this addiction, mm -hmm. and you may not realize it until one, two, three, four, five years down the line. Wow. And then once you're exposed, if, whether you're a minor or a person who may have a profession, then it's a possibility um, you may need to get help. I'm just wondering how come the, the medical staff, like your own physician, doesn't recognize when he or she gave you this medication, how long you've been on the medication, and when it's time to wean off the medication. And I, I, I really pose that to the medical uh, you know, professions as well as the pharmaceuticals. I'm like, you guys know what this is. You keep saying, especially the pharmacists, they see it comes through every three months, four months, and they don't think to say, you know what, you need to talk to your doctor about the longevity of this medication. Again, it's a okay. multi-billion dollar industry. Oh, most it's definitely about the is. Money. Most definitely um, But is. there are some um, civil lawsuits mm -hmm. that's going on nationally in terms of some attorney, attorney general's offices yeah. are uh, looking to sue some of these pharmaceutical companies um, that for responsible right. for some of this, what they call opioid uh, epidemic in right. the United y States. You got to take a stand sooner or later. You know, something's got to come out of this besides, you know, our loved ones being ill and then they having withdrawals and then, you know, the, the, the anger and the frustration with the entire family, you know, and, and children. Like, I, I do remember that we had a chance to meet a colleague of yours, uh, Dr. Dudley, and she talked about oh, yeah. um, children who actually actually take their parents' medication and the parents don't know that their pills are short for a reason or medication that's left over that should have been uh, disposed of. Now Absolutely. you guys do something with that, don't you, with the yeah, disposable yeah. program? Yeah, yeah. I, w I want to backtrack just a minute and just kind of give you a, um, a picture of what happens with the opioid user. Okay. So the moment they no longer access the medication, then that's when they um, experiment with heroin because heroin is a lot cheaper. And so uh, the av average opioid pill can be about 25 to $35. Wow. And a pack of heroin is about 10 to $12. And so what happens is people trying to um, um, mm -hmm. complete feel that appetite they have for opioids and or that morphine mm -hmm. and, and so the heroin becomes a new drug of choice and and there's a huge danger in our country that comes along with heroin uses and what that is is most of the heroin is now laced with fentanyl wow. and so when you lace fentanyl and heroin together it's 100 times more potent and you know a lot of young people are dying from the fentanyl patch and things of that nature. Absolutely. You know, and so oof. one of the things that, um, and one of the beauties of the work and the training that we do is because we understand that some people need medicated assisted treatment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that means that people need medication to um, come back with the uh, withdrawals, right. um, the now, dependency. Is that where you develop or design your MAT program? Tell us about the MAT. So, I'm so, sorry to change so, it, but so I just want to no, know no, about this that's MAT what I, Yeah, so okay. MAT stands for Medicated Assisted Therapy or okay. Medicated Assisted Treatment. Mm -hmm. And what that means is there are programs out here that specializes with people who have opioids. And in that case, they may have to take medication to help them to cope with those problems. Okay. So there's a medication called buprenorphine, there's a medication called Suboxone, um, and of course methadone um, is probably one of the oldest uh, medica a liquid form. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of medication out here these days to help people to cope with the withdrawals, because it's really, okay. really hard when people are not properly detox from right. those type of drugs. 
Wow. Mm -hmm. you, you know, Andre, I'm, I mean, just can't just be a one-time visit d d for you to come. you got to come back and tell us some I more. I think we, ne we should dedicate two months just talking <laughs> about addiction. I, really, because it's like <laughs> this is, the you know, the, the, yeah. the situation that's going on throughout the state of Michigan and beyond us. And, you know, it's knowledge, a global is, problem. Right, knowledge is I mean, key. But I, I, did, I didn't ask you if someone wanted to volunteer to, you know, be a part of your agency. Oh, absolutely. Do you have a website? Uh, we have a website. We have a phone okay, number. Our we, website is recovery the number four Detroit.com. Okay. That's recovery, the number four Detroit.com. Our phone number is 313 365 3100. That's 313 365 3100. We are always in need of volunteers to come and help and just be there for other people. And the training program, I mean, people want to be interested in the training program. You know, somebody's going to say, you know what, I've watched my loved one suffer, die, whatever have you. I watched kids on the street in the neighborhood go through these changes. I need to get involved with something, and this is a program that I need Absolutely. to be a part of. Absolutely. That's it. Okay. That's okay. it. Yeah, we, we, we've got to get the, the message out, and you have so much going on. I, and I wanted to tell you, um, I know about your women's conference, okay? So now yeah. let me ask you this quickly. Is the women's conference yearly, monthly? How is that done? <laughs> well, we have a monthly women's conference at okay. Detroit Recovery Project okay. where we average about two to 300 women every month. And it's an array of support services. It's a, an array of workshops. Um, we also do some makeovers, makeup, hair. Um, we're trying to really work to help build the self-esteem. That's wonderful. Uh, health checkups. Uh, mammogram screenings, etc. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful, and I had to get that in there, Andre. Oh, thank you. You know, it's like well, women always feel like you know don't, nobody's paying me attention. There's no services out here for me. But you guys cover the gamut, and, and you were one of the speakers I, a couple I, years ago. We got to get you back out there. Hey, I'd be more than happy, more okay. than happy, Jay. You know, and I always look at it like this: you always want to tell someone where you come from to get where you are today. So no one has to look at it like, oh, they don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Oh, they haven't walked in my shoes. Ladies and gentlemen, we've all been through something. So don't dismiss us like we don't know. And that's important. Okay? Amen. And it's really important. Thank you. Okay. So, and, and Andre, you know, you got to come back and tell us some more because we just touched on a little bit of the services. So the conference is, is monthly. The women's yes. conference is monthly. Yeah. Okay. And your training program, how often can a person get involved with the just training? Just have them call our office at 313-365-3100 okay. and they will be directed to the right person. Okay. Okay. And do you guys have those medication dispensers, uh, disposable dispensers? On uh, your, you on know, your we don't have them, but mm -hmm. there are um, places that we can guide you to okay. to properly dispose of your medication. If you have old medication sitting in your medicine cabinet, it's important that it's properly disposed it because must. people, young people and adults, are going inside of people's old medicine cabinets, mm -hmm. taking them old um, prescriptions yep. that when you didn't use the whole jar for your dinner appointment mm -hmm. and they're getting high off okay. of it. So you become you a drug the truth. dealer. Right, right. And that's part of the opioid epidemic. People just taking old medication and say, well, they didn't use it. They're not going to miss it. And they didn't need it. Right. And then it should have been disposed of even if you have to flush it down the toilet, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. You know, but we got glad you uh, came to see us. Give us that number again. Thank you again for having me here, okay. Marcia. Okay. Uh, again, our number is 313-365-3100. That's 313-365-3100. Right. And the website? Recovery for Detroit.com. Thank you so much, Andre. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know, it wasn't enough time for uh, Andre and I to go into a lot of details about uh, the, the opioid addiction and other programs that he's involved in with Detroit Recovery Project, but you can always go to our website, justastalkshow.org, Twitter, hashtag Facebook, all that, and then he will be back. Okay, so I'm your host, Marshall Florence for Just Ask, and what do I always say? If you know a person with a disability or if you just have a general question, don't be afraid to ask, just ask. I'm your host. Thank you.